All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the League Express podcast. My name is Jake Keenan, and joining me as always is the editor of League Express, Martin Sadler. And again, Martin, another weekend full of football. Oh. Or well, rugby, we should say. Well, Some people might get upset at us saying football. Or rugby league, never mind just <laughs> yeah. rugby, because rugby in your country is rugby union, isn't That's it? That's right. No, it's been a fascinating weekend. I mean, it, it began on, um, on, on, on Thursday, Thursday morning, actually, our time, with... Um, a, a, a wonderful game between the Broncos and South Sydney. Did you see that game? Yeah, yeah. It was good to see the Broncos get their first win in the season. Great win for the Broncos, yeah, absolutely. And um, carried on on Thursday night with a really tight game at Salford. Salford just um, almost beating Wigan, but an inexplicable dropout from his posts by Mark Sneed mm-hmm. taking a short dropout just gave Wigan the chance for Jake Wardle to catch the ball and touch it down and you know the game was lost for them and then um friday morning um we we had um two australian games didn't we penrith beating Parramatta, Mm. um and um i think it was cronulla um having a win at their place as well um Mm. against the bulldogs Mm. so great and then friday night we had leeds and saints um interesting game i mean leeds you know looking great for half the game and then saints overtaking them mm. and then on saturday morning we had that incredible try mm. didn't we xavier coates yeah in the xavier corner. coates one of the most incredible put downs you'll ever see i mean michael ennis said it was the greatest try i'd ever seen mm. i would qualify that and say it was the greatest put down mm. i've ever seen the greatest actual touchdown where he he leapt seemingly six foot into the air and you know was completely outside the field of play but somehow managed to get the ball down amazing wasn't it really mm, yeah I had a good hard think about it and uh, some of the great tries I've seen there's only two that I could sort of compare in terms of the, the put down itself I remember Nathan Ross um, an ex Newcastle Knights winger back in the day or well, I say back in the day probably 2013 2014 around then uh, putting down a pretty magical um, try in the corner I'll have to try and find the vision of that one absolutely and uh, David Noel for Luma. I don't know if you remember, I think it was back in 2013, they put a cross-field kick and he seemed to have uh, leapt above his winger and then, yeah, he got his legs taken out and managed to just put it down with his And don't body. forget Dominic Young last year yeah, Dominic for, for Young. the Knights. That was a great put-down as well, you know. Yeah. So, the, you know, the, 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 it's amazing how that change in the rule uh, whereby the touching the corner flag doesn't count as going in touch mm. has opened the door to all sorts of brilliant tries mm. many of them and it, it, it's it's staggering to sort of think how uh, what, what looks like a very small change in a rule mm. can have such big outcomes isn't yeah. it yeah and you do see the teams working on it at training these days those put downs they'll get like a a high jump mat and place it next to the corner post and then yeah, yeah. have the winger sort of go and put it down in the corner with another pad hitting them as they're trying to make the uh, put down absolutely so, yeah yeah um yeah something you probably wouldn't have seen back in the not, 70s and 80s not so. not in those days no not no. in my day i'm uh, glad to say yeah yes but um <laughs> yeah it just goes to show how athletic some of our players are getting um fantastic but yeah we'll take a look at the weekend's results martin so um yeah wigan 20 two defeated Salford 12 um, quite a good fight for, for Salford but you mentioned that short dropout uh, well Mark Sneed had an absolutely brilliant game until about the 75th minute mm. when Wigan forced a goal line dropout and Mark decided for some reason and I'm not sure why because they were winning 12 points to 10 at the, at, at the time he decided that uh, it was going to do a short dropout Um, And it didn't work. Um, It fell into the hands of Jake Wardle. And both the centre and winger, the Salford players, had sort of moved up to try and take the ball. Neither of them got it. So when Wardle caught it, he had nobody in front of him. So it was... It was a fairly straightforward try for him, and it, it just punctured the Salford balloon, really. And uh, they got another try afterwards. Um, and it was 22-12, which didn't really represent the game. I thought I thought Salford had taken Wigan all the way. Mm. Um, you know, they're a great team to watch, Salford. And, and you know, they'd, they were coming off having beaten St. Helens. Um, and it looked for a long time as though they were going to beat Wigan as well. And, uh, you know, good for Wigan. You, you, you know, Wigan never ever give up to the last minute and they didn't again 
and uh, they they got a victory, which was fantastic for them, mm. but obviously disappointing for if, if you're a Salford fan. Yeah, seems to be the way Salford go, isn't it? It's just they live by the sword, die by the sword. Oh gosh, um, yeah. I think like I guess a lot of the onus has to be put on um, the wing centre combination on that side as well. Usually, when you do go for those short drop ups, you want uh, the centre or the winger just holding to back drop in back. case yes, uh, it does get tapped back towards them. Uh, and you mentioned there, both of them seem to have gone from the ball. Well, the I'm ball. fairly sure that in training this week. The Salford team will have been looking at that and um, putting it right next yeah. time they have a, a short dropout if they ever do have one, of course. Which uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a great fan of short dropouts, precisely because what happened to Salford is precisely what could happen to any team risking mm. a short dropout from under their own posts. It, mm. it just, you know, the risk is too great in my view, mm. and, and, and it was shown. Yeah, especially that crucial time of the match. Um, but yeah, and I guess some of that could be put down to, uh, you know, Noel Faluma. I think it was, it was his first match, wasn't it? Was, it was, so, yes. Uh, that combination there. He's I mean, it looked good apart from that, but, you know, it um, <clears throat> it was just a bit of a disappointing way for it to end for them. But mm. that's, you know, that's rugby league, isn't it? Mm. And, you know, sometimes the great teams just keep finding a way to win. Oh, so, they do indeed, um, yes. Yeah, going to be tough to beat Wigan this year. Mm. Um, moving on to the next match, uh, Saints 18 defeated Leeds 8. Uh, and as you mentioned, Leeds started the game pretty strong in this one. Yeah, they were eight nil up, weren't they? And um, you know, it, it, it looked it looked to me as though they were going to hold on to win. But but the, the the thing what the thing about them was that they actually should have um, they, they they really should have held on. Well, they should have scored more points. Actually, that's 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 the point about their game, isn't it? They they. They were really dominant. They were playing exceptionally well, I thought. Certainly the best performance they've given this season. But mm. the trouble is they they only got eight points ahead. And when St. Helens began fighting back, you, you sort of got that strange feeling inside you that, gosh, you know, Saints, uh, Leeds have been good, but Saints, <laughs> Saints don't know how to lose, basically. Mm. In that sort of situation, and um, you know, unfortunately, Leeds didn't have anybody who could seal the deal for them. And um, Saints scored 18 points without reply to, uh, to to win the game when it had been eight six and half time. But you know, Leeds will learn a lot from that. And of course, the two teams play each other again this Friday night in the Challenge Cup. So mm. that's going to be an interesting rerun of that game, isn't it? We'll see whether the result is different. Mm. And we are starting to see signs of that Leeds spine. You know, clicking. There are glimpses. Oh, um, I think so. Yes. Lachlan Miller seems to be finding his form there at fullback. Uh, well, I thought he had an outstanding game, didn't he, mm. uh, Lockie Miller? He looks, um, you know, he, he looks like the artful dodger at fullback, doesn't he? Mm. You know, he's, he's. You can see that he's got that sevens background, can't you? Yeah. Of, um, of, of, you know, elusive running, and uh, you know, he. he it, 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 I think that was the first game in which I thought. Lachlan Miller would be a real asset to Leeds. Yeah. You know, I'd been unsure before that, but I think that that game demonstrated that he's he's a really good player and will bring a lot to Leeds as the season unfolds. No, definitely. Uh, moving on to the next match, Lee Leopards 54 defeated Hull FC 4. Uh, a, a depleted Lee side, we will say, steered around the park by Matt Moylan. Um, what did you make of this performance? I think the, the bookies actually had uh, Lee going into this game as the underdogs, which was they did, <laughs> a yeah, bit which, of a surprise. You know, so how much do the bookies know? You yeah. know, it, it was frankly pathetic by... Hull. I can't find a better word to describe it. Unfortunately, um, they're just uh, they're just not good enough, and there's no you know team spirit seems to be lacking from what you can see. The only Hull player who could hold his head up high, in my opinion, was uh, Tex Hoy, who mm. I thought had a good game at um, at full back, and and you know did as much as he possibly could to try and reverse that tide of. Lee tries, but of course the player of the game was Matt Moylan, who was absolutely brilliant. Um, I mean, a lot of people are saying he is the number one signing that's coming into Super League this year, and that game really showed it. You know, when uh, everything he did turned to gold, even even goal kicking, he you know he kicked nine goals, nine out of ten, mm. um, and you know his 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 ability to you know just 
delays, passes and so on and and just put people into space was, was absolutely brilliant. Mm. And it was a joy to watch, actually, and it will be a joy to watch for Lee fans, but not just Lee fans, for the rest of the season, in, 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 in my view. But, but the fascinating thing about that game um, was, you know, you, you look at who was missing for, for Lee... Um, Asiata, the captain, John Asiata, mm-hmm. Edwin Epapi, who has been was so influential before his injury, um, and Lachlan Lam. You know, three absolutely key players. Now, at the start of the season, if you'd said me, if you'd said to me, what will happen to Lee if those three players are going to be out? I would have said they'll struggle to win a game, mm. um, but they didn't struggle at all. And one of the fascinating. Um, things um, about the game was Ben McNamara um, came in, ex Hull player, made his debut for Lee and had a great game. And, and Hull let him go last year. Mm. Um, you know, Brad Dwyer, the the, the, the hooker, um, was at Hull. Had a, he's on loan now at Lee from Warrington. Again, looked a world beater. You know, mm. why are Hull letting? I've run a piece this week saying. You know, why on earth have Hull let so many players go who look to be better than the players who replaced them? Mm. And, you know, that's a legitimate question, I think. And you, you, you just wonder where they go from here. You know, they, um, it's, 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 it's very sad because they ought to be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, clubs in the game. They, they, you know, their support is tremendous, although many of them were leaving long before the end of the game on Saturday. Mm. Um you know they play in a big stadium they they could fill it if they had a great team and yet they just you know just don't seem capable of doing it they they won the challenge cup in 2016 2017 under Lee Radford but since then they've just drifted mm. and drifted farther and farther down the table i'm afraid yeah. and you you know you you, you do despair at uh, at, at 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 hull um but having said that you know it's great for Lee, and, and, and Lee looked to be as good as they were last year, if not better, probably better, I would say, uh, with, with Matt Moylan coming in. And they're showing, you know, with Ben McNamara coming in and playing so well that they've got a, a squad that's got depth in it, uh, mm. which they probably didn't have last year. They're gradually building um, a bigger and deeper squad, and... I think, you know, they, they had a difficult start to the year with three defeats against, you know, quite big teams. But I think Lee will rise up the table and mm. they'll be a challenge for anybody, uh, you know, uh, th- this year. And, you know, there are some big games coming for them and it's going to be fantastic to see how they do. Mm. Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, do you think that's exactly what Matt Moylan needed? He needed just to have that chance to be thrown the keys and said, you know, Thrown into the deep end. Yeah, yeah, steer this side around while Lachlan Lamb's out. Absolutely. Um, and it seemed yeah. to work. Yes, because I'm not sure. When Lachlan Lamb has played alongside Matt Moylan, I'm not sure that they've really fully got come to terms yet with who's in charge of the team on the park. Mm, yeah. You know, and, and, and both... In in a sense, are, are dominant players, aren't they? And uh, but but on on Saturday, Matt Moylan had the stage to himself. Really, he was clearly the the key player alongside McNamara, and um, he just ran the show. Mm. And uh, on the other side, Tony Smith is he under pressure? How many weeks do you oh, think? Oh gosh, <laughs> got to be. He has um, in the job. I mean, Tony Smith has a very long coaching record, largely a successful one. Mm-hmm. But it looked desperate, and he looked pretty desperate. I've got to say, I mean, I'll be no no coach is happy when his side is losing by that amount. And um, can he find a way to turn it round? Well, of course, he's got a lot of players missing. There's, they've they've probably had more injuries and um, disciplinary problems than any other club in Super League so far. Mm. Um, so you know th- they can turn it round, but they're going to have to start doing it fairly soon and they can't allow performances like this to go on much longer because some of those supporters who are such fantastic supporters um you know will they stick with them through performances like this well Mm. gosh it's you know very unlikely i would have thought many of them yeah well fingers crossed they can uh figure it out and and strike a few they need to because their next league game (laughs) is against Hull kr Uh, you know another local derby um, and you know that another 
another absolutely one-sided local derby wouldn't be any good for probably either side, to be honest. Mm, no, definitely. Uh, moving on to Hull KR, they uh, defeated the Giants 24-12. to um, Pretty good performance for Hull KR. I think they needed that uh, sort of bounce-back win um, after losing the week before. Well, they did, and, and the, the difference this weekend, or the, the weekend just gone in that game, was nine levels, really, if mm. we're honest about it. Nine levels played at full back. Peter Hicku played at, at the centre. And Hull KR just looked a much better team because of that. Yeah. Nine levels was our man of the match, I think. Um, and, you know, the way he chimed in from full back. I mean, I've admired Nile Evels as a fullback for many years. I think he's potentially an England fullback, to be perfectly honest. So, and I've, I've, I, I, I thought he was a great player in his Salford days. When he went to Castleford, he had a lot of injuries, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But at his best, I think he's a really great fullback. And, uh, you know, I was delighted to see him playing so well. And Peter Hicku as well, scoring two tries. Um, you know, for for for, for the Robins at, in in that game, um, and it just all looked really good. You know, they, the, the the Robins looked good. The, the Giants looked nondescript, if we're really honest about it. Um, you know, it's it's it's, it's funny. The, um, the I mean, they did score two tries late on, and two very good tries actually. Um, Kevin Nagama and Adam Swift both, mm. you know, scored fine tries. But far too late, they were losing 24 nil mm. before they scored in the last um, you know part of the game. And there's something, there's something not quite right about the Giants. I mean, they had a massive win the week before at Castleford, but to, to lose at home in that sort of way, um, and you know you, you, you look at them at, at the John Smith Stadium, they, are, they desperately need more support, yeah. but they're not going to win it by playing like that unfortunately mm. and 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 again you sort of wonder you know about some of their recruitment decisions and you know you wonder what's happening off the field because you would hope that they would play better than they did absolutely no in, no incisive play until right near the end um which you know was so disappointing. I mean, when Kevin Nagama scored the try, it was put through a gap brilliantly by Aston Masters. Mm. <coughs> and that just looked fabulous. But as I say, by that stage, they were 24 nil down. And, you know, Mikey Lewis had um, a big influence on the game, of course, as he always does at the moment, but very sadly went off for a head injury assessment in the second half, which he failed. Mm. And I think Jake Connor was a bit lucky not to get into big trouble for that uh, incident, by the way. But, you know, putting that aside, he'll he'll miss the Challenge Cup game now this weekend against Salford. But um, Hull KR just look, you know, it, it, it's a strange thing. We, we've, we've, we've got the competition breaking into two parts, um, you know, a, 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 what you might call a, a top eight, um, which in which Hull KR and Lee are both very definitely members and a, a bottom four which you know is london castleford uh hull and possibly huddersfield as well mm-hmm. huddersfield are on the sort of verge of you know they, they can't afford to lose too many more games mm-hmm. or they'll lose contact with the top teams so um you know it's disappointing really for them mm. yeah just before uh, the game kicked off and even last week i was sort of having these thoughts that they just seem to have that fullback issue and it looks like now that they've solved that problem how okay i'm speaking about here um and well i, I couldn't just... understand why peter hicker was playing at fullback to start with because no. he's always been a center mm. um apparently he'd, he'd said he wanted to play fullback and Willie Peters had said he'd try him out there. Mm. Um, but I think s- Saturday's game should end that argument, really. Mm, yeah. yeah. I was even having thoughts about... I mean, about... Neil Evels is not a winger either. That's the other point. Yeah, true. I was even having thoughts about, you know, is it time to maybe throw Mikey Lewis back at fullback and get his hands on the ball a bit more? Mm. Um, but, no. yeah, I think uh, over the weekend, I think they've solved that uh, dilemma. And so. I think he's got quite a good link with Tyrone May as well, mm. you know, which is... Uh, uh, I mean, the TV people made Tyron May the 
player of the game. I'm not quite sure I agree with that, but but nonetheless, you know, it, it, it it's a good combination that's developing well. I think. Mm. Yeah, moving on to the next game, uh, Catalans forty defeated uh, Castleford four. Uh, or was it 14? I can't read my own handwriting here. Um, 40 yeah, 14, points to 14. 4 to 14. So, yeah. uh, 40 to 14. So, um, I think they, uh, the Dragons scored a few tries late in this match. It sort of blew out the uh, scoreline a little bit. But yes. an improved performance for Cass following their... Flooding. Well, it couldn't be much worse than it was the previous week. So, mm. you know, they're, they're clutching at straws, really. I mean, to, to say that you're reasonably happy as Craig Lingard did with a 40 points to 14 defeat sort of shows where you are really doesn't it and mm. um and and similarly uh, Steve McNamara for the the Catalans coach was unhappy mm. with his team's performance and again that sort of says something about the relative strengths of these two clubs but the, the fact is that Castleford haven't got a side at the moment that can compete in Super League and They've made it fairly clear. I, again, I, I've, I've written a piece in the magazine, in, in the paper this week, saying basically these uh, IMG gradings are, are, you know, corrupting Super League this year because a club like Castleford is far more concerned now about how it picks up points in other aspects of the grading other than on-field performance, and they're devoting a lot of their resources to to doing that. Um, I think they're going to sign some players this week having said that, but you know, th- w- when you actually say to clubs that, that performance on the field isn't everything, then you g- give them a very good reason not to, you know, not to, not to strengthen as, as, as they ought to. Mm. And I think that's happened to Castleford and, and, and to London, unfortunately. Mm, yeah, definitely. Uh, moving on to the next game, we had Warrington 58 defeated London uh, 4 down in London. They'll face off against each other again this weekend in the uh, Challenge Cup, I believe. But um, probably no real surprises here from Warrington. No, no. And it's, it's depressing, isn't it, to see such a one-sided scoreline. I mean, when, when IMG came into Rugby League, they said they wanted to focus on Rugby League in London and, and developing the game's presence in London. Well, this isn't the way to do it, is it, really? Um, we, we've, we've created a system whereby London know that they're out of Super League next year, so why spend a, a fortune on buying top players just for one season? Mm. You, you couldn't do that anyway. Um, so I'm afraid they face a season of results like this against the top teams. I mean, the only games that London fans can really look forward to, I think, are the, the, the games against teams like Castleford, Hull, maybe Huddersfield, probably not Huddersfield though, mm. but, uh, you know, the games where they've got a smidgen of a chance of winning as they nearly did against Hull a week or so ago, you know, it's, it's, it's very disappointing. And, um, you know, we've got to get... Uh, and it, it, what's so sad about it is they're playing at such a good little stadium now at London they've got lots of potential for drawing new support they've done some great work in trying to bring in new support as we saw the crowd of over 5,000 for the first game against Catalans but they're going to lose support rapidly if they're going to be hammered like this every week mm. at home you know they've been given a tough fixture list as well that's that's the other thing you know with um as a newcomer to Super League, they've they've been given some of the toughest fixtures, you know, right early on, and mm. uh, I'm not sure how wise that is, really. But you know, that that's how it is. Yeah. So somehow they've got to find a way to cope. Mm. Almost wish that they were playing like a championship, um, you know, level side this weekend in the Challenge Cup, just to see maybe where they're at. I know, yeah, uh, yeah. They're back at Warrington. Got Warrington again, so yeah. fingers crossed we see a bit of improvement. But um, some exciting news out of that one. Um, Stephen Ratchford with his goal kicking. Um, yeah, broke the record for most consecutive... Well, no, didn't break it. Equaled it. it. Yeah, equaled equaled it. it. And as he was trying to break it, he missed the goal. Oh. So that's, that's yeah, that that's... And he knew as well, because you could see when he kicked, when he, you know, missed that goal, he could sort of... You, you knew that he realised that he'd yeah. failed to create a new record. Forty-one, I think, is is the figure that he got. And um, 
pressure. You know, he's got to start again now at the beginning. Yeah, I don't think I'd like to be uh, taking that kick. No, no, uh, not at all. The weight of the world on your not shoulders. Not at all, no. But he's a great player nonetheless, is Stefan. So, mm. you know, a fabulous player. And uh, shame he didn't get it, but, you know, you can't have everything, can you? Mm. <laughs> and just the way that that uh, Warrington side seems to be gelling at the moment under Sam Burgess. Well, Matt Dufty, three tries. <laughs> Josh Thewlis, three tries. Adam Holroyd, the second row, got two tries as well. You know, it, it's it's coming on. Um, four wins out of five games. That's mm. that's very impressive. Their only de- uh, their only defeat was in Perpignan to Catalans, and that was a very narrow one. Mm. So I think the preliminary report on Sam Burgess is that his appointment looks like being a success. Yeah. But let's you know, <laughs> you've only got to have one bad performance, mm. and then people will start saying the opposite weren't they rugby league is a very unforgiving game and uh, but some you know i'm delighted to see him having some, some success with warrington and i obviously hope it continues and uh, you know who knows where that where they can go this year mm. and unlike the the broncos they haven't faced uh, saints or wigan yet so not yet no we'll and that was the, that, of- that, that was the, the disaster for them last year you know they had eight successive wins to open the season under daryl powell but then they played Saints and Wigan, or Wigan and Saints, I can't remember now the order in which they played them, but they lost to those two teams, and they never really recovered from that, Mm. you know, and and that's weird, isn't it? Um, And, you know, they they, they performed so badly that Darrell was eventually shown the door, Um, so hopefully that won't happen to them again this year. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, we'll see. I mean, obviously, they'll play London again uh, this weekend, so who knows, they might decide to rest a few players, but uh, sure. yeah, we'll see. Um, we'll move on to some of the news. So it's been revealed that Scotland and Ireland will uh, not be able to compete at the next World Cup after the IRL board stripped them of their full member status. Um, what's your reaction to this news, Martin? Um, well, it's disappointing, isn't it? Because, mm. we, you know, we, we'd, we'd all like to see rugby league taking off in Scotland and Ireland, but mm. they've not had the development that um, would justify them being given full member status yeah. of the IRL, and that's that's disappointing. But what I hope is that they'll, in those two countries, they'll, you know, put their backs into, you know, establishing more teams, you know, getting a better competition going and so on. There's even talk, by the way, um, you know, with, with the... Um, the, 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 the reorganisation of the Championship and, and, and League One and with the League One moving to 12 teams hopefully in 2026 mm. there's even talk of the Edinburgh Eagles you know making an application to join League One at that time and that would be an interesting move wouldn't it mm, um, you know I'd, I'd, I'd love to see the uh, Eagles you know attracting a, a, a level of player um, that could actually compete at that level. And um, Edinburgh would be a great place to live, actually, if you were looking to be a part-time rugby league player. So, mm. you know, it's... Um, who knows what might come of that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And But that also includes um, Italy and Lebanon. They're also yes. set to miss the World Cup as well. So, Well, no, cup- Lebanon won't miss the World Cup. They'll be in it because they they reached the quarterfinals right, right. In, in the last World Cup. So they are guaranteed... a place in, in this tournament so does that just mean that they've just uh, lost their full membership yes, status but um, they'll still be in the world cup yes that's right, right. right. yeah got gotcha, you yeah. got gotcha. you um yeah interesting hopefully but I, I guess the next world cup it's going back to a, a 10 team world cup and we still don't know when and well we don't know where it's going to be or, or precisely when it's going to be do we mm. the international rugby league board to my knowledge has not yet made an announcement about the tournament um which fills me full of worry really because we're we're already into 2024 and that tournament is supposed to take place in 2026 it's time to get a move on Mm, no definitely um now you just touched on it before but um and we sort of spoke about it last week as well but there's been a restructure uh, around the championship and league one competitions going uh forward from next year i believe are you able to touch on um that that restructure and, and what it could mean for yeah well it's a complicated one in a way because um they they want to the the the, 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 the the, the the clubs in the championship and league one decided in their wisdom that they wanted to have um to, to move to two divisions of 12 below super league and 
Um, to do that, they're going to see... Um, I mean, it's 14 and 9 this year. Next year, it will be 13 and 10. And it will be... Um, Two relegated, sorry, two relegated, one promoted, but also a sort of a, a million pound type game between, I think, the third bottom club in um, the championship and the winner of the um, promotion playoff in League One mm. uh, for that other place in the championship. So you could get two or three teams being relegated from the championship and one or two teams being, re- being promoted from, from League One. Uh, and then something similar will happen the following year mm-hmm. to, to, to to get the numbers, you know, to 12 and 11. And the RFL is inviting applications from anyone who wants to um, come in as team number 12 um, in, in that year. Now, that could be um, a team from the NCL competition, the amateur competition, the elite amateur competition, or it could be a team coming in from somewhere else in the country. And as I say, I've mentioned Edinburgh, mm. um, but you know maybe the scope even for a an Irish team to come in, or or maybe a team from Bristol, or or maybe London Scholars to come back in. Who knows? But mm. um, we'll we'll see how that goes. Mm. No, definitely. And um, is that? Uh, I think uh, there was a lot of talk about maybe an amalgamation between. Well, that's the two what I would have preferred. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and 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 funnily enough, we. Um, we had a readers poll last week in on on our website totalrl.com and the question was what would you like to see happen to the championship in league 1 and we gave them the readers about five different five different uh, alternatives mm. <clears throat> and the one that was winning and, and unfortunately our website went down on friday afternoon and uh, as though it was only restored yesterday, so it was down for about three or four days. Um, but what was clearly winning at the time it went down was uh, to amalgamate the two competitions into one and then to have a graded fixture structure, mm-hmm. which kept the top and bottom teams away from each other. And that is what I would have proposed and did propose, actually, uh, to the Rugby League last year. But in their wisdom, they've not gone with that. And I think I think that would have been far better. I don't think having promotion relegation between Championship and League One is a sensible system. I think, you know, give clubs the chance to climb up a, uh, a competition ladder, you know, um, in, in, in a more organic sort of a way, uh, rather than having... I mean, you've got a situation this year, for example, where Oldham are in League One, but they should be, you know, in 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 the championship. They're 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 far too good for League One, mm. and you know, so so you get a situation where somebody, um, you know, takes over a club, puts a lot of money into it, and they become too good for that competition, and that's that's what's happened there. That's what's happened in a way with Wakefield in the championship as well. So you know, let's let's move to having a. Well, it's they're not going to do it, but I, I was going to say let's move to having a graded fixture list, but bring all the teams together mm. uh, in, in 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 a move that would sort of um, remind us of of the days when rugby league used to have thirty clubs all in one league, mm. which I think probably worked best, to be honest. Yep. Yeah, it's all going to be a bit confusing going forward over the next couple oh, of yeah, years. Oh yeah, sure. But I'm sure we'll we work change it out. we change the structure so often. Yeah. In rugby league, it's just crazy. We looking for the silver bullet, you know, that will deliver success and interest from um, potential new supporters, and it it doesn't happen, uh, unfortunately, mm. um, which is very sad. But you know, we, we're always banging our head against a brick wall, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, the good news, though, for the championship is that it looks as though you know we are going to have a broadcaster, hopefully, Premier Sports broadcasting games this season i've not seen yet a confirmation of that but um we will have um a number of games quite a number of games i think that 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 will be broadcast this year and and that's great uh, if if it happens because you know the championship does need some exposure it's a really great competition Mm. but it needs exposure and uh Hopefully that will bring it. Mm, no, for sure. Now, um, the Featherstone uh, Rovers, uh, they've had their chairman, Mark Campbell, stand down, or he said he's going to stand down uh, following some cash issues they've had at the club. It's been pretty well publicised this week. Um, it sort of comes after Craig Hall posted a statement uh, on social media saying that he's yet to receive payment for his 
uh, testimonial match that uh, took place last January, so January 2023. Really? Yes. So um, mm. a bit of uh, a bit of sad news there, but it seems like um, the club's well, going to work to sort that out. The trouble is that Featherstone gambled everything on promotion, winning promotion to Super League, mm. and again it, it illustrates how ridiculous the whole idea of promotion and relegation is in a in a sense because you know teams we 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 moved to having two divisions in 1973-74 and since then we've had a succession of teams that gamble everything on promotion spend money they've not got mm. borrow money in other words sometimes mortgage their stadiums to try and get up into a higher league and then of course if it doesn't work, as, as it hasn't for Featherstone, they end up having enormous debts but still being in the lower level competition mm. and they can't pay off their debts and that's what's happened to Featherstone, it seems. You know, it, it's, it's absolute madness. I mean, we see it on a bigger scale in football, of course, where we've got um, the news this week that Nottingham Forest have been deducted four points in, in, in the Premier League because when they got promoted, they they lost 30-odd million pounds that year simply spending money they hadn't got to try and stay in the Premier League. Mm. And, it, you know, maybe they can afford it. I mean, there's so much money in football that they can perhaps afford to, you know, to tolerate enormous losses. But, but in Rugby League, there's so little money that we can't even afford to tolerate what, by comparison, are minuscule losses, really. Mm. You know, and... Um, it's 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 very sad to see those stories about Featherston because Featherston is just a great club, a great stadium, great you know, a great venue. It's 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 been a, it's a great nursery for rugby league. But it you know I I hate to see bad news stories about a club like that. But that's unfortunately what it, what we've got. Mm, yeah, it's very sad. But uh, fingers crossed they can uh, get it all sorted out going forward. Um, now, in your column this week, Martin, you mentioned the RFL. Um, they sort of had a, a study done over the last few years uh, looking at head contact in our sport, and it looks like there's been a bit of a decrease this season. Yes, well, they they, they, they actually looked at um, head contact for far over five seasons from 2018 to 2022, and they found that tw- roughly 12% of all tackles in those five years involved the neck or the head, mm. which, is, which seems a big figure to me. Um, but this season so far that figure has fallen to 3%. And obviously people are saying because of the crackdown on, uh, on, on, on that sort of tackle, you know, the players being red carded and yellow carded, um, the problem appears to have declined very significantly. Now it may be too early to say, I mean, that was based on the first four rounds of Super League. Mm. And that may be too small a sample really to, to draw definitive conclusions but um having said that it's better to have um a trend in the right direction than in the wrong one isn't it yeah it's good it's good to see you know fewer tackles involving the head because obviously we we all want to save a game and none of us like to see players being concussed and uh having you know fa- failing head injury assessments so mm. Let's uh, let's hope that that trend does continue. Speaking of um, you know head injury assessments, uh, did you see Jeremy Marshall King, the uh, hooker for the Dolphins, over the weekend? He uh, copped a, a kick or a football to the head uh, from a Ben Hunt kick, and he was forced from the field for a HIA <laughs> yeah. after getting a, a little bit dizzy after yes, taking that. Yes, well, I'm sure he would be. Yeah, because oh. the force of a rugby ball being kicked into your face gosh oh yeah classic mm. falcon uh, i don't think i would like to go through that um now speaking of uh the nrl the rumor mill it's alive and well um there's been a few media personalities in australia that have linked some of the issues that are going on uh, at south sydney and uh they've they've linked sam burgess as uh, a name that could be the uh, succession plan for if they do decide to get rid of uh, Demetrio this year. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that? And well, my advice to Sam um, would be, not that he needs my advice, but if, I, if he were to ask me, yeah. I'd be very glad to give it to him. And my advice would be not to take that job. Yeah. I mean, I can certainly, if Sam makes a success of Warrington, then he'll be lined up to take a job in, in, in the NRL. 
but my advice would be to take any job other than South Sydney. Yeah. Because South Sydney is such a goldfish bowl club. You know, it, it's it's the club that's in the heart of Sydney, of course. And, you know, everything that happens there tends to be magnified a thousand times in yeah. the Australian media. And you've only got to sneeze at South Sydney and you're, you're on the front page of the um, Sydney Morning Herald or the Sydney Telegraph. It'd be a lot easier for Sam if he were to coach elsewhere and, um, you know, do a great job with, with another club, somewhere like Canterbury, for example, yeah. you know, which uh, who are not doing too well at the moment, are they? Mm. Um, you know, or, 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 or somewhere like that. Um, but to go to South Sydney, I think the pressure would be absolutely enormous because he's so linked with South Sydney. He's so, you know, he's... he's, he's you know, he, uh, you know. I, th- I, I, I think sometimes you, you, you need to take a step back from all that pressure and take an alternative route. Mm, yeah, you're absolutely right. And it makes you wonder what's going on uh, at that club and, and if the reason for his departure last uh, year is starting to, you know, show, I guess. Well, with, everybody's having a go at Latrell Mitchell, aren't they? Because yeah, of a, a, apparently a, as well, yeah. um, an interview he, he, he gave on, um, on, on a radio station and used a lot of expletives. I think, uh, you know, he said the F word four times, apparently. Mm. And, you know, as I say, because it's Latrell Mitchell who did that, it's, it's all over the newspapers. If it had been somebody playing for North Queensland or somewhere, I don't think it would have made such an impact, mm. you know. It, it's, it's strange, and, um, but, you know, there's, there's been a lot of... I mean, Latrell just is an incredible personality and attracts such a lot of attention. Um, I mean, he even had a spat with Anthony Mundine, didn't he, the former yeah. St. George player and, and boxing champion, um, who's an indigenous man as well. Um, about the uh, incident involving Spencer Lenu and Ezra Mann. And um, <coughs> Anthony Mundine had said that Ezra Mann ought to man up or words to that effect. Mm. And Luttrell jumped in and defended Ezra and made some disparaging comments about, about Anthony. Yeah. And Anthony, of course, hit back as, in, as inevitably he would. Mm. And a lot of people are saying the problem with Luttrell is he's too much in the media and he needs to focus more on his game on the field. Yeah. Um, which may be true, and of course he is a great player, and you know he only needs to have one great game, and I think all will be forgiven. Yeah, well, there's been um, talk of potentially Wayne Bennett going back to the South, and then bringing Sam Burgess back as an understudy, which he originally did with Demetrio, and which he's mm. doing now with Christian Wolfe at the Dolphins. I just, I just don't know what's going on at that club at the moment. How long can Wayne Bennett carry on? It's amazing, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? I mean, I he's, mean, he's well into his seventies now. Yeah, and the I'm performance they had on the weekend. I'm delighted. To to see older guys doing well for fairly obvious reasons. But, um, no, I, you know, how long Jason Dimitri will last at Souths is anybody's guess. Mm. Uh, I think he's got a tough job there. Um, but as I say, rugby league is a funny game. You only need one big win. And, of course, this weekend they're playing the Roosters, aren't they? Mm. Um, Doesn't get much easier for them. No, no, but if they beat them, are they, are yeah. they playing at... Um, where are they playing it? At Accor sure. Stadium or at um, or, or or at the other the, the, the new stadium? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, a Lions it? Stadium. It's called, yep. isn't it? Um, hopefully the latter. Um, but if they get a big win there, they'll you know everything will be rosy, won't mm. it? Yeah, yeah. Water under the bridge. Mm. Um, well, mate, that's pretty much all I have. Is there anything else you'd like to touch on before we wrap up today? We'll get into um, next week's games shortly. But any other news you wanted to? Touch no, on? not not. No, I don't think so. I think we've, you know, covered quite a bit there. If we wanted to just talk about the Challenge Cup games this yeah. weekend. Yeah, yeah. We'll um, go through and uh, get your quick picks, Martin. Uh, so, uh, Friday night, we've got Leeds taking on Saints, another rematch from uh, this weekend or last weekend. Well, I suppose you've got to go for St. Helens again, haven't you? And, um, you know, I, it's, it's fairly obvious that um, Paul Wellens will want to do well in the Challenge Cup this year because he'll want to win a trophy as soon as he possibly can, uh, having won the World Cup Challenge last year, but not won, not won the Cup or League last year. Yeah. So I think, I think they will be coming determined to put one over Leeds again, but it should, should be a great game, there's no doubt about it. Just a quick one, mate. Is it 
almost uh, is, a, is a bit disappointing that these two are facing off so early in the fixtures. Not really, no. It, it's 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 a look of the draw, and yeah. sometimes the draw brings out you know great fixtures um, in the earlier rounds, and um, it's good that it has really because it's obviously a it's a game that's going to be covered by the BBC, although not on TV. It's <clears throat> it's only going to be covered online mm. on the BBC website, which is a bit disappointing, but um, that's how it goes. Yep. We have uh, Wigan taking on Sheffield. What would you think if I said I thought Sheffield would win? Would you, would you think I was a lunatic? Are we taking you that microphone would. out of your hand, mate? You probably would. Yeah. No, I mean, obviously, Sheffield, it, it, it takes us back to 1998 when Sheffield beat Wigan 17-8 at Wembley in a game I still remember very well, but... Um, you know, there's only one winner in this game, isn't there? It's mm. obviously Wigan. But hey, on any given Sunday or any given Friday in this case, no, uh, I don't think on any happen? on any day at any time, I don't think <laughs> Sheffield would win this game. Uh, maybe if we see three or four red cards, yeah, uh, yeah, we'll see. You know, uh, I think Wigan are too disciplined for that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, then we have uh, Hulk KR taking on Salford. Well, that's an interesting game because Hulk KR will be missing Michael Lewis, as we said earlier. He's going to be serving out a. Um, a concussion stand down and um, that's going to be really interesting then to see what um, what happens to the Hull KR selection I suspect that Willie Peters might put um, might put Peter Hicku in to partner um, um, Tyrone May at halfback uh, and, and I don't know if Tom Opacic was injured last week, but if we assume that he wasn't and was just rested for the Huddersfield game, then he'd come back in at the centre with nine levels remaining at full back. So mm. that's what I would anticipate if everybody's fit. Um, and I think Olkiao might just have a bit too much for Salford this, okay. uh, this, this Friday. I mean, but they've already met this season and Salford beat them 17-10, but that was at Salford. Mm. But, you know, it's, it's going to be a fascinating game, isn't it? Yeah, definitely uh, out of the three. I mean, probably watch the Leeds Saints game, but, yeah, that's another interesting matchup I wouldn't mind watching. Uh, then moving on to Saturday, we've got Huddersfield taking on Hull FC. Well, you can only go with Huddersfield here, can't you, given Hull FC's lamentable recent form. But neither team played well at the weekend, so I think both teams need to win to give some confidence to their supporters. Mm. Then we have uh, Lee taking on uh, Featherstone Rovers. Well, that would have been a great game two or three years ago when they were both in the championship and both vying for promotion to Super League. But now Lee are probably far too strong for Featherstone. Mm. Then we have uh, Batley Bulldogs taking on Castleford Tigers. Well, fascinating. You know, Craig Lingard going back to Mount Pleasant, the team he used to coach. Um, You would imagine, I mean, obviously any Super League team ought to beat any championship side. But if there's going to be an upset, this is going to be the one I think that we're going to see where it might happen. Because Batlier, you know, they always compete well, especially in knockout games. And um, they could pull off an upset. I, I, don't, I don't think they will. I'd tip Castleford to beat them, but keep your eye on it because you know if they get, if 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 the Bulldogs get their noses ahead, then I think they could pull off a shock. Mm. Then we have uh, Warrington taking on London again. Uh, well, again, you you've, you've got to say it's Warrington all the way, haven't you? Yeah, pretty easy one that one you would think. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, on Sunday we have Halifax taking on Catalans. Well, again, you can't see Halifax you know, beating the Catalans. Um, and, I mean, the Catalans won the Challenge Cup in 2018. It's hard to believe it's now six years ago. Wow. But mm. um, I've got no doubt that they would want to be going to Wembley again this year. So I can only imagine that they will win. So we'll have a um, a quarterfinal um, round of all Super League teams, I think. And that's that will get very interesting, won't it? Yeah, de- most definitely. All right, mate. Well, um, that wraps up uh, the weekend's matchups. Uh, and again, another weekend full of rugby league. Can't wait. Uh, mm. And yeah, good to see the uh, the the Super League sides coming into the Challenge Cup. So um, it would be good to think there would be some good crowds this weekend. But sadly, I suspect there won't be because, of course, people can't get in with season tickets. So yeah. you know, it's it's all pay at the gate. And in recent years, we've had such poor attendances really for you know the, the Leeds Saints game for example is an interesting one 15,000 or more were there last Friday what will we get this week probably be lucky to reach 10,000 I would think mm. and the other the other games will all be significantly less than that so 
that's such a great shame mm. but uh, you know rugby league commercial needs to find a way of filling grounds for challenge cup games yeah and they haven't done it yet It'll be good to uh, compare some of those figures uh, next weekend, uh, next week on the, on the uh, podcast. So, um, don't forget, guys, if you wish to uh, grab your subscription to the weekly League Express paper. Yes, uh, here's the front page the front this week. There. It's all absolutely great reading. Yep. Great um, reading. Get it in most uh, news agents uh, across the north and uh, online at totalrl.com forward slash shop. And uh, if you are listening to us or watching us on YouTube, don't forget to uh, hit that subscribe button so you can be notified every time we upload our episodes and uh, other content. Um, but yeah, Martin, we might wrap it up here, mate. Yeah, I think we might. And um, good to see you again, Jake. And good to see all our um, viewers and listeners. And uh, we hope to see you again next week. And as a bit of a bonus, I think next week we should have Gary Schofield joining us. Ah. Uh, Eminent League Express, demand. eminent yes, eminent <laughs> League Express columnist, yes, and a guy who just happens to have played forty six times for Great Britain. No, absolutely, we can't forget that. No, awesome, no, he wouldn't let us. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. All right, mate. Well, um, yeah, we'll do it all again next weekend with uh, next week with uh, Gary Schofield. Cheers, mate. Thanks, mate. Cheers, Cheers mate.